We are so excited to share that we have a new opportunity for folks working in family ministry. The Rooted Family Ministry Mentorship Program. It provides both small group and individual coaching for volunteers, youth pastors, or associate pastors who oversee family ministry in their church context. This 12-month program includes small groups of six to eight led by one mentor in both a cohort and an individual setting through a carefully crafted curriculum designed to help you grow spiritually as an individual and as a leader in your congregation. At the end of the program, we expect you'll be prepared to equip the volunteers and parents in your congregation to disciple the next generation to know and love Jesus. Additionally, when you complete the program, you'll receive a rooted family ministry certificate to affirm your commitment to join God in the work he is doing in the lives of the families you serve. You are listening to the Asian American Youth Ministry Roundtable, part of the Rooted Family of Podcasts, advancing gospel-centered youth ministry for those serving in Asian American contexts and their students, equipping those serving to more effectively disciple students, and empowering families and churches to minister to Asian American youth more faithfully. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. Hello. Uh, Welcome to the Rooted Asian American Youth Ministry Roundtable. I'm going to be your host again. Uh, My name is Justin. I'm glad you guys can tune in and listen to us today. We got a part two of last time. And so today what we're going to be doing is another roundtable podcast. Uh, We got our Dorothy and Huey with us. And so uh, they're going to be filling in with a ton of great insights. Um, So continue to ask your questions. Let us know what, um, what thoughts you guys have for us. But today what we're going to try to do is talk about the future of the Asian American youth ministry as best as we can talking about projections, concerns, and expectations. Uh, but before we get there, uh, for some of you guys, while we're still kind of new, uh, want to introduce who we are and let you guys know a little bit about who we are and, uh, the ministry where we're doing it and all these type of things. So I'm going to start with, uh, Dorothy, uh, who are you? Uh, what city is your church located in? And then uh, how old is your church? Yeah. Hi, I am Dorothy Lau, Youth Director at Chinese Bible Church of Maryland in Rockville, Maryland. And my church is coming on or just past 48 years old. So it's coming up on 50 years and uh, that's half a century. Yeah. So it's seen some things since 1976. Is Was it a church plan? Did it just pop out of nowhere? So the direct language is that it was a church that started by having a small group of persons at another church being commissioned Mm. to plant elsewhere. Okay. Okay. That sounds very familiar. Uh, I've read a lot of those origin stories. Okay. All right. And are you, are you suburb urban? It's it's kind of a blend. It's mostly metropolitan. The DC area or surrounding area is very much metropolitan. So it's not strictly suburb. It's not strictly urban. It's more like cloisters of um, towns or cities and then um, pockets of density around it. And okay. then drive a bit of ways and there's another cloister of uh, okay. city or metropolitan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. I would say it's like a blend of suburban and urban, but it's not strictly one or the other. Oh, interesting. Uh, a lot of first gen, second gens, third gens. Oh, wow. There is all three of those. So there's the first gen, which is the immigration uh, parties. Mm -hmm. That sounds weird. First gen immigrants, second gen children born of immigrants. But there are quite a decent number of persons who are third gen and following. I met a gentleman um, when I first started working at CBCM. Uh, He is, I want to say, a seventh or eighth generation Chinese American, but his family's originally from like the Portland area, Portland, Oregon. So um, his family's been around, but just there are some of those who have been around for a while, but they're still in a Chinese church for whatever reason. And God bless them because of it. Ooh, that will be a question for later. Okay. So Huey, what about you? Um, Yeah, I am in a church called Christ Central Presbyterian Church uh, in Centerville, Virginia, which is about Uh, 25 minutes west of Washington, D.C. We're in the suburbs, and our church has been around. We just celebrated our 36th anniversary. Oh, wow. 36 years. Not too long. Did you have to do anything for it? I I preached that Sunday. Oh, man. They gave you the the main service? What an honor. Dude. Did you have to to suit up? 
No, we, we don't suit up ever. You don't <laughs> suit up ever? We don't suit up ever. No way. What kind of Asian American church are you? <laughs> Actually, when I first got here, we, we were still used to suiting up, but it's been it's been like about 10 years since any of us have suited up. Here. Oh, man. This is a podcast on its own. Just kind of the dress of the Asian American churches. Hey, mm. the, the freedom, the freedom I feel, man. I, I You wear flip-flops on the pulpit? Okay, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, that was too curious. Yeah, hats, I don't think hats. Can, can you do hats? Um, I, I did hats. I wore hats in my youth service, but not, not in the main, main service. Yeah, yeah. okay. And you don't get, you don't get, you, you don't, know, you don't get emails from that. Nope. Wow, nope. interesting. <laughs> Wait, how old, you, how old is your church filter. again? Thirty-six years old, bro. And you can you wear hats. Wow. Okay, that's that's where we got to go. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Justin. I'm in Houston, Texas. Uh, we started off wearing suits when I ha first came in and now I'm into like jeans and I can't wear a t-shirt yet, man. I, I still got to wear button downs uh, or else I'm going to get some emails. But uh, our church just celebrated our 70th year uh, nice. here. I think we're the first Chinese church here in Houston. So um, yeah, I, I don't, but we don't have like seventh or eighth gen Dorothy. That's that's they're migrants they didn't grow up in yeah. these but still yeah i feel like i don't even know how that's possible is that possible yeah because chinese been in the u.s as early as so. around like the mid 1800s i yeah. want to say like 1840s okay okay yeah. and you got you guys do your own youth services like separately? we don't we yeah. don't not anymore not for the last 10 plus years yeah yeah which so uh, there, there are some who sometimes return to that uh, proposal of we should have a youth service because the language I'm reading half the time is our kids are distracted or they're a distraction in the main service. Yeah. But I hear more like mm, we just also need to familiarize ourselves with family worship. Ooh, okay. So let me. Okay, you you put that out there, Dorothy. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start our first question with this. Do you see the future of the Asian American? youth ministry going back to, to that model or do you think it's going to be more family main service oriented so i got vody bakum on my mind i also have a lot of these type of things so where do you think the asian american churches are going to head this is just my opinion so please don't quote me on this even if this is recorded man it's recorded <laughs> um, on the interwebs I in general, right, considering the Asian American context, or at least I'll speak to my context, right, and being Chinese American, but uh, maybe Huey can also empathize, although under different circumstances. Um, as much as I see the uh, the focus that exists for youth having their own service, that's really what our Friday nights are, is like a microcosm of the English service, or just like smaller scale, they have worship announcements, icebreaker, discussion, message, right? Not necessarily in that order, but they have all the elements, more or less, that would be comprised of a youth service. And so to have a duplication of that on a Sunday, mm -hmm. number one, I always think about something I learned from a church planter is the most laborious and resource intensive thing a church can do is have a worship service. And mm -hmm. so- for the most part, our youth ministry is run by like seven to 10 individuals. And if we have a youth service, is there the expectation that these seven to 10 individuals who are already pouring into their Friday nights yeah. for these kids, are they also going to be running a youth service? Or is there an entirely like new staff or um, different team who are going to be handling that? Are the kids going to be doubling up on leading worship on Fridays and Sundays? Yeah. And so try to go back to your question. Like, do I see that there's going to be the return to that model of having youth service? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the idea is yet again put out there, but I do not think that the Asian American church will go in that direction because the more integrated that students and their parents like are farther from their heritage in a sense, like um, farther the, down the generations that exist in their families, you're not really going to be operating off of Chinese or Korean or Vietnamese or et cetera language anymore. You're going, start, you're going to start operating in English. So why create another service when you're still using the same language? Hmm. Uh, but who's going to be running the services? I think that's where church should actually look into hiring more staff and reasonably cannot rely on certain volunteers to yeah exercise all of their weekends for the sake of a specific ministry. So I'm just yeah. trying to be realistic, but also consider and protective of the time that 
um, our church members have towards specific ministries. And if they're constantly serving, how are we able to build in or model rest for them? Yeah, that's good. I mean, you also bring up a good point about not doubling up something that's um, that you do like twice or three yeah. times a week. It's, and again, it's resource draining. It's exhausting sometimes. And then again, if you're going to do that all year long, how in the world do you expect them to continue to go year to year to year? That's, that's, that's really good. Hugh, do you have any thoughts to, to what Dorothy said? Yeah, I, I resonate with everything that she said. And I, especially the part where Sunday services, it just takes up so much human capital. Yeah. Right. But, but check this out. Like our, our church. Um, so for about 20 years, it operated very similar to a to, to an immigrant, um, you know, Asian American context where youth kind of met on their own had had their own service. Um, and in the last 10, 10 years or so, we moved away from the model um, because kind of the I think around that time was the philosophy of youth ministry was shifting where um, there was so much focus and energy on family ministry, so much focus on intergenerational stuff that uh, the youth uh, pastor at that time moved us kind of into uh, worshiping with the wider, broader church. Mm -hmm. um, and we've kind of, we were, we've been that way for the last uh, 10 years or so, but right after COVID, um, we decided to move back to a youth service model. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that was, um, that was kind of a whirlwind of a shift. And all the students that I have in my youth ministry now um, they never knew a youth ministry where they had their own service. All my students, like they, they, they didn't, they grew up without a youth service. So going into kind of a youth service model, this is like brand new for them. Mm -hmm. And they actually, I think for the most part, they actually love it and they're, they're thriving, thriving in it. So my kind of, you know, last two years, just having, having done this, my conviction is in 10 years, we'll, we'll be, Keep, we keep doing this. Um, I think is I think there's a there's a great possibility. I mean, I what I hold on to is is not so much uh, which which model is is right or maybe even biblical. What I hold on to is um, I believe with all my heart, parent partnership and intergenerational integration. That's biblical and that's worth holding on to. Um, so is there a way for us to live those two values out even when we have a youth service? Mm. Right. So whether you have a youth service or not, I think I, I, for me, at least, like I hold on to that with loose hands. I, I think coming out of COVID, um, our, our elders and, and, and a bunch of us just kind of agreed that our youth, youth students were sort of losing their identity a bit. And mm. um, we kind of moved into a concerted effort to, give them a home, you know, and give them some sense of belonging and ownership of the church. And that was kind of one of the reasons why we started a youth service. And I think that was, that's been good for us the last couple of years. Okay. Um, but what I don't want to lose within this conversation is regardless of what model you choose, both parent partnership and intergenerational integration in youth ministry is vital. Yeah. So we, we have to learn how to live that out, whether you have a youth service or not. And, and like what he said, it just takes different energy uh, when depending on which model, which model you're going at. Yeah. So I, I think 10 years from now, I don't know, personally, um, I but hope there, there doesn't hopefully doesn't need a, a youth service. Uh, but if if there is one, um, what's what's important is how do we live out some of the core values uh, that our youth students need uh, for in youth ministry? Yeah, I, I think for me, it. It really depends on what you mean by youth service. Like I think if it if it replaces the main worship element of the church, and I think this is where terminology in the leadership has to really, really be fleshed out and clarified, right? So I mean, because I'm like, if you have a youth specific, youth demographic cultivated for students, their time, I think that's great. But if it replaces what I guess the the gathering the corporate gathering where it's the liturgy it's the prayers it's communion it's baptism like you know it's baptism all of that type of stuff that should be central for any gathering of a church and so i that's how i how i see it too so i'm like you know I, i'll take both of y'all's and i'll go hey uh, that's awesome where i was coming from 
I think it wasn't until year seven or eight. And we were tracking kind of where our students went. And so here in Texas, like there's a ton of great college Christian ministries. So, I mean, like they go to the big school, they go to, they could have a pick of whatever, and it would be fairly solid. Right. But then we saw the drop off after college. It wasn't the first two years of college. It was the first two years after college. And our question was, where in the world are they? And yeah. so um, a couple of things popped out because number one was, hey, our ch Chinese church wasn't the only player in the game, right? There was a ton of different places to go. And so when they saw that, hey, there's a lot of good quality preaching and worship and stuff, the question they asked is, why do I go back to the Asian American church? And so we were like, okay, that's a huge question. I think it's valid. And then another one was, did we do something in the youth ministry that maybe like set them off in a weird trajectory? And so um, that's where for me, I'm going, man, I wonder if we didn't prematurely pull them out of the main congregation and then silo them off into their own and they forget what it looks like to be a church after youth group. And so for me, I, I feel like, that's something that most churches need to think through in terms of the future of, okay, we're not just taking care of them for these seven years or six years, however long you have them for students, but what does a biblical healthy church member look like beyond us? Right. And so, uh, which again, could be a podcast in its own. We're just talking high level projections at this point. We're just the whole point of these last two podcasts. We're just teasing everything. And so uh, that's, that's where we're going. Anything to add for anything? Yeah, Dorothy. Yeah, I just want to ask a follow-up question for you, Justin, is for those students who have been coming back, you know, in that college period or even after college, do you see any commonalities that exist among those particular students as to why they go back to the Chinese church as opposed yeah. to go yeah. that um respectfully, that that Western Americanized mega white church down the street? Sure, sure. So I think so we're still tracking the trends. Fortunately, we have enough data points to where we're like, eh, we can finally see a little bit of correlation. I think some of it is the family is still there. Like mm -hmm. not, not just mom and dad, but like grandparents and great grandparents sometimes. And so you start seeing a lot of familial ties, but then also they can't get as involved in the other churches like they do in Asian church. Like it's almost two extremes. The Asian church we're like, we throw you into the deep end the moment you raise your hand, right? Like, or, yeah, without, without membership, without being Christian sometimes, right? Like, we'll just throw you in and we're like, hey, we'll give you a seat at the table and you make decisions, whatever, right? And sometimes people miss that. Like, hey, I can, I can serve really, really hard and I don't have to go through any hoops, right? I'm not saying any hoops, but you know what I mean? Whereas a larger, more yeah. established, a larger, more established church, they may not see that type of service for like 10 years. And so that's where some of them are coming from. Um, I, also, yeah. I also think it's, it's for most people, it's in their mid to late twenties, even where they feel really comfortable and even confident in their own skin. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like they, they grow up in kind of the Asian American context and they're, their eyes kind of, and the world kind of broadens up in college, um, and they they have all these experiences, and 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 then it's not a, until they're a little bit older that they realize, oh, I am far more Asian than than I thought, or far more a that that they, they're com they begin to be comfortable in their own skin that they actually choose to go to a, go to go back to an Asian American. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's good. And again the leadership of these Asian American churches have to think through this, right? Multi-generationally, because if the students are coming back, how might we disciple them well, right? And and go, hey, we're, we have a challenge, a unique opportunity too, uh, to minister to multiple generations. Um, and then again, I think as the cities are getting more compressed, I think you have just more variables of different people. Uh, which brings in more challenges, but also brings in more kingdom ministry, which should be pretty awesome. That leads me to my second question uh, in the projections. Uh, so I don't know about you guys, uh, but here we're seeing a lot more diversity, ethnic diversity, but also just kind of from everywhere. Like Dorothy, you're like from the burbs, from like the metro area, all that type of stuff. 
Uh, how do you guys see youth ministries specifically, not the churches necessarily, but youth ministries specifically adapting um, and serving multiple kind of subgroups? Like, have y'all already experienced that? Is there, are there pushbacks from parents or leaders or even other youth and, or is it pretty steady? Something that comes to mind off the bat is I'm involved in a local pastors network or cohort. Um, and these are all specifically like youth ministers, coworkers, pastors, et cetera. And it is fairly multi um, ethnic or diverse, um, which I appreciate because youth ministry, even if we are in very ethnic specific contexts, youth ministry is not isolated to a specific oh. ethnic group. It's just that that's our context in this current season of life or maybe long term. Um, but what I really admire is that these other youth ministries, um, although they only have English usually as the operating language, um, they've taken kind to recognize that in this area, there's higher rates of immigration from persons coming from the Middle East, mm. um, also from uh, Latin American countries and uh, some from Asia, right? But if there are going to be any Asian immigrants, they're usually going to go to an Asian church. But needless to say, I recognize that there is a lot of diversity that exists in the county in which I live here in Maryland. It's actually one of the most diverse counties in the country. And um, I think that other churches, not particularly ethnic specific, uh, like ministering to one people group at a time, um, they've done well to minister amidst that diversity. Mm -hmm. Whereas because I'm in a, a Chinese specific context, um, the the mission and vision is generally clear in that we're mostly trying to reach Chinese persons for the gospel. But in youth ministry, we're not exclusive to only having Chinese students or Asian students. It's just that um, I recognize for them and for myself when I was a teenager, there are students who gravitate to an ethnic specific context because that is their safe space. Yeah. And I'm not trying to discount the importance of the biblical um, imperative of diversity, right? But that, and and everyone is to be reached for the gospel, but like sometimes you just want to be in a space where you are with people who understand you and you don't have to over explain yourself as much as you want to be in a ministry that can reach the gospel for the nations. So I'll keep it at that. But um, yeah, I really admire good. the diversity that exists in the network that I'm part of and that they're ministering to new immigrants. Um, but I think that sometimes you have to create a new ministry for that diversity um, because in a way it still subconsciously and um, incidentally pushes out the minority. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Hugh, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I'm encouraged by is I think um, to serve, serving in multi-ethnic subgroups is actually a, a lot easier for our students because they're constantly around mm. um ethnic diversity right and i think something that i that i value is that our our asian american students as asian americans serving multi-ethnic subgroups because because we inherently believe that um god has positioned us and and positioned us and um as asian americans to be in this particular season in this particular location to be able to serve Right. Meaning, meaning we as Asian Americans have something to offer. That That's that's the thing that I want to communicate is yeah. I, I don't think our students have issues or struggles or getting out of the um, outside of the Asian American bubble because they're they're constantly around the, the diversity. But as Asian Americans, as an Asian American youth group, we to, to really believe that we have something to offer to the wider community. Yeah. I think that that's where the. Um, the challenges and and where the opportunity is. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I mean, again, the, the Lord has made us who we are, put us in a certain time and space for a ministry for a time and space. And I think our, if our students get that, man, they, they become lights and salts every, everywhere they go. That, that'd be an awesome picture of the gospel. All right. Time's getting away from us. We got one question left, believe it or not. All right. So we're going to end with, Let's go with the crazy one. All right. Um, if you're going to build a youth ministry survival kit for the year 2050 with all of your vast experience and knowledge of youth ministry, 
what's one thing you would include into this survival kit? Oh my gosh. It could be, it could be an actual item. It could be a thought where they can just like download, like, which is what's one thing that you're getting this like young youth minister to be like, good luck. 2050 version of you and is the bible assumed or it has to be in oh no that's a, the, the, the okay we'll, we'll give you the the bible's always included right okay. now which I'm translation gonna, what you would have to say justin me yeah oh, man. you know what okay if, if i were to give like kind of like let's call this youth ministry will like, <laughs> that sounds morbid okay, okay you know what i'm talking about Yay. i would get i would give them my database of games Oh, oh, right. And and I would do it where like categories are like, try at your own risk. These were f- fun ones that I don't know if you can get away with legally like that, those type of games. And then all your like, here's some just basic icebreakers that I've accumulated over the last two decades. <laughs> um, Here are here are the best deals you can like, like just kind of a, a game icebreaker package. Um. Uh, that would be my gift to the youth ministry world. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But after hearing you talk, I would, if, if I had it my way, I would give the new youth guy the ultimate health insurance package. Oh, wait, wait, for him or for yeah. the youth? Yeah, no, no, for him. For him or her. The games that Justin suggests. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a package. Yeah. You buy two, the get 50% off. Insurance. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, like with all the, counseling included all of that just the oh whole that's thing. that's good man that's I mean, good because yeah. because because i think we really have to um not in a idolatrous way but we have to prioritize our health yeah both physical and emotional so that we can serve well and so that we can serve for the long haul yeah okay? and so i feel like youth ministry is always it, it not always it, it tends to be people stepping stone to bigger and better things right um but i but i think part of that is because people have been wounded people have been hurt um and they just don't see it for the long haul and i wonder if we gave our, our churches gave every youth pastor or every youth leader every chance to thrive right and every opportunity to thrive can they stay for a long haul i I want to, I want to say, I want to believe that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Man, you make my answer look like, like, uh, (laughs) no, you're (laughs) right. All right, Dorothy, finish this off. Um, I would just say a refillable, reusable water bottle. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Like, is this magical or is this No, it's just a water bottle. I mean, maybe inscribed on it are like, suggestions for how to talk to people i don't know and and the only reason why i say that is because one is like it's so important to hydrate right because um (laughs) even as jesus says he is he he can give you living water like yes but my body also you know needs to (laughs) have physical water um but for our students i think a lot of them are thirsty spiritually but they're also physically thirsty because they are running from one thing to the next and their hydration method is bubble tea and that is not helping their liver mm. or their kidneys. So I think just water is the source of life as the Lord is. And um, knowing how to talk to people, I think studies have shown that persons are more likely to open up or be vulnerable with a hot drink in their hand. So maybe that's an insulated bottle. I, I don't know. Um, but reminding students or persons that it's important to have your thirst quenched and it's also important to know how to talk to people because um who knows if phones will still be the going thing in hot future. take hot take man oh. so good so good insurance packages water bottles list of games you guys heard it here first uh yep. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna copyright all of this stuff quote me on that one Yes, all royalties. If any sponsors want to, Dorothy is the way to go. (laughs) All right, everybody. Thank you guys for listening today to the Rooted Asian American Youth Ministry Roundtable. We look forward to your questions, comments, and sponsorships next time. Uh, But until then, may the power of the gospel uphold us and carry us through as we trust in the gospel. It's power for ministry in our lives. And so be sure to follow us at The Rooted Ministry on Instagram. 
Again, thank you guys for listening. See you. Thank you for listening to the Asian American Youth Ministry Roundtable, part of the Rooted Family of Podcasts. You can go even deeper into gospel-centered, Bible-saturated youth ministry by listening to our other podcasts, including the Rooted Youth Ministry Podcast and the Rooted Parent Podcast. Find them all at rootedministry.com. Do you remember what it felt like to be a little kid at Christmas time? There's nothing quite like the anticipation of Christmas morning, but the holiday can lose its wonder as we wake up to the many hard things going on in our lives and in the world. The loss we feel over our childhood experience points to a deeper longing inside all of us for everything sad to be undone and for us to live together with God in perfect joy. This fall, Rooted is releasing a new Advent devotional for teenagers with New Growth Press called Longing for Christmas. We look at 25 promises God made and fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. As we explore the way God has kept his promises, teenagers will be encouraged that all of the longing they feel for a better world and for things to be made right will be fully met in Jesus Christ.